Queens Council meeting for Tuesday, September 22nd at 9 a.m. It is hereby called to order. I'd like to welcome everyone to council meeting today. I have potential regrets from Councillor Johnson this morning. He wasn't certain if he would be able to attend as of last evening. However, I don't see him present, so unless he shows up shortly, I uh, will accept his regrets for not being able to attend. I would ask that everyone in attendance please put your electronic devices on silent mode, if you would. And I would also like to notify everyone present that we are recording this meeting by video and audio. Uh, it is a very sensitive uh, set of equipment and therefore if you whisper to your neighbor it may be on that recording and be able to be heard. Moving on to 2.0, changes, approval of agenda. I have nothing to add to the agenda this morning. Are there any additions to the agenda this morning? Council Fancy? Uh, I guess I'm just trying to think where I need to put it on here, but uh, uh, I'd like to talk about unsecured loads. Unsecured loads. <coughs> Put it in as 9.2 on the corporate services bill. Okay, thank you. Any other additions? Yes, Council McLeod? Um, yes, Your Worship. I, last uh, meeting we had a discussion in finance about the cost of living increase, potential increase, or whatever the decision was. And I'd like to add that again to the finance section. And I do not have the paperwork that was passed out by the finance director at last time, so I'm wondering whether we could get a copy of that again. I don't know if it's relevant to your discussion today, but we can certainly add that discussion under 11.2. Presentations today we have 3.1 Grant Thornton 2019 2020 audit report. And I understand that Kelsey Murphy is here from Grant Thornton. If you'd like to come forward to the presentation desk, please. Today I'm going to provide more of a high level summary of that and if you do have any questions at any point feel free to interrupt me. So we'll start with the consolidated financial statements. You will note that the package includes section A, B, and C. B is supplementary financial information, the non-consolidated statements. Those are not included in our audit opinion, nor are the trust funds. They do include an advisory to reader with each section just to let everyone know that they are unaudited. Within these statements, you will also note that the independent auditor's report is not yet included. That will go through a little bit separately. It is um, only included once council approves the financial statements and we have appropriate signatures. So on page A4 is where we will start. This is the consolidated statement of financial position which shows your financial assets, liabilities, and non-financial assets for the year. So one thing we like to point out was under public sector accounting standards that the municipality or the region falls under, we report financial assets, so what's liquid and what could be used to pay bills, and non-financial assets are items that are not easily convertible to cash, 
majority of that balance is made up with tangible capital assets, so buildings, land, and other items that are used to provide services to the region. So under our financial assets, you will see that there is an increase in cash. So this year, the balance is a little over 20 million. Now I'd like to point out that balance is made up of numerous items, some of which are, are restricted, and uh, our reserves that are set up for specific and intended uses. Receivable balances are actually down this year. There is a note that describes that further. The good news is that taxes receivable is down the most, and an allowance has been able to be decreased because collections have become better. So that gives us total financial assets of 22 million. Under our liabilities, most of these items remain fairly consistent year over year. You will note an increase in long-term debt as there was a new debenture of 730,000 that was taken out during the year. And there was repayment on long-term debt a little over 300,000. There's also an increase in the solid waste closure and post-closure liability. So that item is a calculation of what it will cost to close and maintain the, the landfill site after it is closed for a number of years. So there is more detail on how that is calculated in note 11, but that liability will continue to increase as capacity is used in the cell. We then look at the total. So total liabilities is 8.9 million, which gets to net financial assets of 13 million. It is a good news story, but that is a positive and a fairly healthy balance. We do sometimes see that that is net debt because liabilities exceed assets. So because it is 13 million in the positive, it shows that the region is in a healthy financial position. We then have non-financial assets of 58 million. Again, I said the majority of that balance is capital assets, which is 58. This year for fiscal 2020, we saw $1.8 million in capital additions and $2 million in amortization which is recognizing the aging of those assets. That gets to an accumulated surplus of $71.8 million. We then move to A5, which is your statement of operations. It shows your revenue and expenditures for the year on a consolidated basis. We like to point that out because most of the time when you look at the budget, it is for the operating fund. And so we do have a note that reconciles the difference between the operating budget that was approved and the budget that is demonstrated here that is compliant with public sector accounting standards. We do add things like depreciation and eliminate transfers because transfers between funds do not show in your consolidation. So at the end of the day, taxation revenue increased quite significantly from the prior year the majority of that is from an increase in residential taxes, which was $417,000 additional, $120,000 more than prior year for commercial, and it was a really good year for detransfer tax, which saw an increase of $66,000 over the prior year. We also note an increase on other revenue from own sources, and that one I want to point out, it is higher than budget because uh, interest income that is earned on the reserves is not budgeted in, in the operating fund or in the capital budget. So oftentimes anything earned in those reserves will, will look as a surplus on your consolidated financial statements. And then we'll note that government transfers, capital contributions is quite a large increase as well. That is a result of gas tax revenue. So the federal government doubled their allotment for fiscal 2020. And that amount, again, is not budgeted because it is transferred directly into reserves and can only be used on restricted projects that are approved in advance. So that gives us total revenue of $20 million. We then look to expenditures. Again, majority of the expenditures are fairly consistent year over year. The one significant increase that we see is environmental health services. And that is the result mostly of an accounting adjustment relating to the landfill. So the difference in the landfill liability between fiscal 2018 and fiscal 2019 was actually that the liability went down. There was a new engineering report in 2019 that determined that future closure costs were lower than the last engineering report. So for that reason, there was a negative expense 
of 725,000 in the prior year. But this year, being a normal year with an increase, we saw a positive expenditure of 156,000, plus sludge removal was an additional cost that was not expected for 125. So those items all combined give us our year over year difference of about a million dollars. Then at the end of the day, that gives us 18 million in expenditures for a consolidated surplus of $2 million. So that is our statement of operations. The following pages, the statement of cash flow and the statement of changes in net financial assets, really just provide readers with additional detail of how the cash balance changed because these statements don't always show only cash items. Things like the change in the landfill liability and amortization, purchases of capital assets, those are not necessarily shown on your statement of operations because a capital expenditure is not an expense on that statement. It's shown on your balance sheet only. So these following pages just give a little bit more detail as to how those numbers uh, can be accounted for. The statements go on further to provide note disclosure uh, regarding the decisions supporting some of the balances on the statement of financial position. But the main one that I want to point out is the final note, which is the subsequent event note which relates to COVID-19. Obviously, COVID-19 has had a significant impact in the world and the environment around us. So we wanted note disclosure to allow readers to understand the impacts of the COVID-19 virus on the region for fiscal 2020. Now the note goes on to detail and say that it's more, it has not had a big impact on fiscal 2020 because year end is March 31st. There was only a small period of time of impact it's likely going to be more of an impact moving forward and that from a timing or a cash flow perspective there was deferral of when payments would be made for property taxes and things like that but the region has sufficient reserves to mitigate the risks um, from any loss or additional, or additional expenditures and that will be continued to be monitored closely so that's kind of my high level for the financial statements the other item that I wanted to go through is the independent auditor's report. So for those that were here with us yesterday at audit committee is appendix C. And if anyone does not have it, I did bring copies with, but um, our independent auditor's report really goes through to break down um, what our opinion is of the financial statements and everyone's roles and responsibilities. So, the opinion, which is now the very first paragraph, is a clean audit opinion. We state, in our opinion, the accompanying consolidated financial statements present fairly, in all material respects, the financial position of the region of Queen's Municipality as at March 31st, 2020, and as results of operations, changes in net debt, and cash flows for the year then ended in accordance with Canadian public sector accounting standards. We then talked in the basis of opinion, how we came to that, indicating that we as auditors are responsible to audit in accordance with our own standards. And the one to highlight, again, as I mentioned earlier, other matters, supplementary financial information, our audit report indicates that section B and section C are supplementary and therefore are not audited specifically. We would take them into consideration when auditing the consolidation as a whole, but we do not offer an opinion on those separate sections. We then go through and list the responsibilities of management and those charged with governance over the financial statements, followed by the auditor's responsibilities, which really defines that we, we use the concept of materiality and we feel that the statements are free from material misstatement. But it also goes on to define that we don't audit the financial statements for fraud and that there's always a risk that that item could go undetected. Um, so that is the majority of our audit report. Do anyone have any questions or anything that you want me to go through in more detail? Any questions of counselors? Councillor Fancy? I just wanted to state that we, we 
had a lot of questions with you, so we, we were, we were uh, <coughs> happy with what, what you brought forward and you articulate very well, so it was, a, it was uh, easy to understand as best we could. So thank you for it. Thank you. Any other councillor? Well, hearing none, I, I want to thank you, Kelsey, for your presentation today and certainly uh, the presentation yesterday to the audit committee was very helpful and as mentioned, uh, a lot of questions asked and answers given, so it's very appreciative. Uh, today, later in the council meeting, we will have another item regarding our audit. Yeah. So, uh, did you have any other comments you wanted to leave with us? No, nope, just thank you for having us today and for all of the questions. It is good to show that you're engaged and you're, you're trying to understand. I know that public sector standards often have different looking statements and others might be used to, so I appreciate the, the questions. Thank you for presenting today. Thank, Thank you, Grant, for all the work. So at this point, I would like to, to note that Councillor Johnson is not present. Uh, I think that would allow Councillor Fisk to take that chair. And I would ask the CAO if he'd return to the chair at the front. Moving on to 4.0, 4 tabling of petitions. We have no petitions to table today. Are there any petitions to table today? Second call for petitions. Third and final call for petitions. We have no petitions today. That brings us to 5.0, public question comment session, and this is an opportunity for members of the public to uh, speak to council. And, uh, I would ask that you please state your name and your address and use the microphone and uh, direct your comments to myself as chair, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Leon Robertson, uh, College Street in Liverpool. First of all, I'd like to uh, compliment your staff uh, with the uh, finishing of the project on Jubilee Street. It looks very nice. It looks like a great job has been done there. Thank you. And uh, also, it's good to see from the financial uh, statements there and so on, that you have a surplus and uh, looks like it's, uh, the finances are in good hands. Now, uh, the other thing which is, uh, I think, appropriate for today is EMO. With the pending storm or the storm that has started here now, I was wondering if you could give us a, just a bit of an update there with respect to what EMO has in place and so on. Um, I noticed from, uh, from uh, on the computer and so on, uh, a lot of people are seem to be in the dark in the fact that they don't know what the procedure is and so on with respect to where the comfort stations may be uh, and I know it's your responsibility uh, to declare a state of emergency if that's necessary is that correct it, it is although under the provincial state of emergency that is more the minister's responsibility at this point due to COVID and, and their state of emergency but to answer your question more fully yeah. Our EMO committee for Region Queens has been in constant contact with uh, Halifax EMO. Uh, our staff have been checking uh, catch basin covers to make sure that they're clear. They've been putting items away that may be movable or blow around. Uh, they've been taking the precautions to, of course, not only uh, protect municipal infrastructure, but to ensure that anything does not blow that would be unfastened away and damage others. They will be looking at the parking lot should we have a surge tide to control the traffic there. And EMO has been reaching out to the emergency service providers in Queens as they normally do ahead of a storm and will continue to do so. And, and this has been an issue that EMO has been looking at since at least at the end of last week. So uh, as far as comfort centers would go, uh, you know the procedure on comfort centers unless there's a need for one, they're not requested to be opened by our EMO committee. 
and there is a requirement for all citizens every storm to be prepared for 72 hours to hunker down and to not proceed outdoors in heavy wind and storm where there is a risk of trees falling on them. So when it is safe to travel, there would be an advisory put out for the region of Queens and it would go on media sources such as the radio channels, our Facebook, our website, uh, other means to get it out to the residents. But if, they, if we have no power sort of thing, then we uh, wouldn't be able to get the information. Is that right? In your package for 72 hours of preparedness, there's a requirement there to state that all residents should have a battery powered radio to be able to get that information. To be able to stay at home, you're saying? For the first period of time until it's safe or there is a need for a comfort yeah. center, uh, we would not be advising that people be able to live with it. If the yeah. storm gets to that level. Has the EMO coordinator brought, he's brought you up to date then recently about the storm, what uh, Brian has in place? So. Brian Hatt was dealing with these issues yesterday. Okay, so, uh, and I noticed there on the, uh, on the Facebook there that the Greenfield Fire Department put a statement on there that they were available if they were, if they were needed. And all of those emergency providers and, and fire stations can put out their own information, mm -hmm. and certainly if they're prepared to do that, uh, they're, they're able to do so. So uh, if uh, within that 72 hours, then uh, we're supposed, everybody is supposed to stay at home and not go to a comfort station, is that what you're saying? No, what I'm saying is there may be a need to stay home for up to 72 hours and you should be prepared for that period of time. If there is a need uh, on day two, then certainly the region would request that uh, residents who need to go to a comfort center, if there's one set up, which I expect there would be if there's a need, where it would be and how to get there in that location. My point is, is how do you find out that information if the power's been on? Again, I'll bring you back to your radio with batteries. That will be on the radio stations that will be available to individuals in the community. And, and I guess, Leon, the, the real catch-22 to this is in the past, people are out looking for comfort centers that aren't open and perhaps shouldn't be on the road at that point in time, early in the storm. And, and it is a safety concern, and that's an EMO directive across Nova Scotia. Any other member of the gallery would like to speak today? Well, hearing none, I thank you. And we will move on to 6.0, approval of minutes, which would be 6.1, uh, the minutes for the regular council meeting of September 8, 2020. Are there any errors or omissions in those minutes that have been circulated? Hearing none, a motion to approve those minutes to circulate will be in order. Moved by Councillor Fisk, seconded by Councillor Newton. Any discussion? Are you ready for the question? Question. All those in favor of the motion? It is unanimous. Thank you. We have nothing today under 7.0 dangerous or unsightly premises. We have nothing today under 8.0 economic development. Under 9.0 corporate services, we have 9.1, a motion of reconsideration, request the Nova Scotia Department of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal, uh, and Councillor Fancy had uh, requested that to be added to the agenda. Uh, would you like to move that, Councillor Fancy? Yeah, well, I must say too, I forgot my glasses, so if I uh, say some word in it, it's not silly, just let me know. And who would like to second that? <laughs> <laughs> So move that the Council of the Region of Queens Municipality reconsider the motion lost at the May 26, 2020 Council meeting which reads as follows. And that the Region of Queens Municipality make contact with the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal to include exit to Highway 8 is at the set of lights. The seconder to that, Council McLaren. Discussion on the motion, Council Fancy. Yes. So, what is what is taking place is when we put up the put up the new signage to say there's no exit to uh, Highway 8. The signage is put down the road. Uh, so, uh, what happens is that people come just to, to the, you know, follow up on why why we, we got to this place in the first place. There was a the big green sign up by the highway says that exit uh, uh, to Caledonia Ketchy. 
he's got errands, and there's, uh, for people traveling, uh, they're seeing it's supposed to be the exit uh, right, so the first road they come to before the, the lights is Old Wallace Road. So a lot of people are taking that exit to go down there, thinking they're going to Kedgy, and then there's the, they see the signage, and then they start to turn in someone's driveway. And the person has got a sign up now saying, uh, children present, please do not turn in my driveway. So uh, what we want, wanted to do is to uh, make an addition to that signage out there saying, exit at right. So then people will know that they aren't supposed to go to the next, next road, but they exit at the right. The sign itself is getting rotten, so hopefully the, uh, the GIR will replace the whole thing and make a, make a sign with that in, uh, in place. We, and why we got to here is because we had made a motion of that, but it was defeated because maybe people didn't realize how bad it was going to get. But it, it's, uh, it's not a great situation right now. Okay, thank you, Councilor Dancy. Any other councilor would like to speak on this motion? Councilor McLeod? Um, I would like to uh, repeat her, what Councillor Fancy had said. The situation with Old Falls Road is uh, the municipality placed a sign on a post saying no exit to Route 8. However, it's positioned uh, such that vehicles are on the street before they actually notice the sign or sometimes they drive right by it and don't notice it at all and there's been a lot of traffic going up through there. Not so much now, but when Queen's Place gets back into full operation, a lot of those folks leaving from there want to avoid the lights, so they're taking that route to exit onto number eight. Uh, but there had been some discussions about and a report given to council about possibly making it a... Uh, uh, council yeah. McClough? Yes. I think we're straying away from the sign just, additional to Well, I just wanted to explain why the signage could be better placed. In and the we're not position. talking about the other signs. We're talking about the one sign in this motion. So I'd ask you to keep your, your discussion and comments relative to the motion itself. Well, I'm just saying the explanation for folks that had not known what was discussed prior to this. So uh, going back to my explanation, so we felt that a sign would be better on the Department of Transportation sign which could say something like exit to eight is at the set of rights or a better wording that would really clarify uh, to try to resolve the issue of traffic going through there. It's a very narrow street. This motion was defeated at the last time and we wanted to bring it forward to consideration because certain conditions have happened since then. The RCMP have uh, patrolled that area just recently and they uh, issued some tickets and they issued some warnings. So that lets us know that that other signage is not working. Okay. Any other council have a comment today? Council Pansy, do you have any last comments on this? No, that's all we have here. <laughs> CAO, this requires a two-thirds majority to pass, does it? It does. I'll just get my calculator out and see how many people that is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we just split the people. <laughs>
sign at the beginning of the road that was requested by council specifically right. the wording says no exit onto highway 8 right so that sign is there the unenforceable or um, enforceable that, that would be a decision of the courts the rcmp have issued tickets to those that have been entering route 8 from old falls road they have been they have been, yes and we yes even though they don't have a sign that's by number eight there, there is a sign can't go from Route 8 up Old Falls Road from that end. It says no, no end. Coming into Old Falls Road from yes. number 8, you're not exiting. Right? But to get on Old Falls Road, you have to buy that sign that says no through fare to Route 8. So one would assume that anyone driving through there would see that sign. Right. So this is to prevent those individuals that would be coming through and see the sign and, and think they can go to Kedgy and go that way. So I understand, the, to do I understand the reason what I'm not understanding, or the, I guess I do understand, is that it's still not working. <coughs> so we're going to add another sign to a situation that's not working. That would be the decision of council today. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Kelly? I just want to clarify, um, we're just, uh, the motion today is just to um, uh, ask TIR make contact with TIR to include no exit to, or exit up to Highway 8 is out of the light. Do we know if that is even within their um, guidelines for signage, if they would do that? We have no way of knowing that they would actually include that just because we asked for it. So it may not be possible from their standpoint. Is that correct? Yeah. I would assume that's correct. We've done no research to determine what TIR sign policies are at this time. Okay, thank you. Councillor Fancy? I didn't ask directly with this, but I know I've asked for other signage, and if they don't have signage, uh, they don't make up signage, put it that way. Uh, now, I have seen uh, on things where it says no exit, so if it is, uh, if it's, uh, and other, other things, so if, say, exit to a high, uh, at lights, um, I guess that's the whole idea is this what this whole motion is is that we're going to be a request we we're not telling TIR we're making a request to them anyway right that's all we're doing here today is making a request to them so and the answer may come back yes or no that's right Councillor Stiff I had my hand up oh, I'm sorry I'll go to Councillor McLeod uh, the issue is there is an issue um, people are going through that street we had a petition presented by the residents on that street, and uh, I think there has to be some consideration for that. Um, signage isn't just the resolution. I mean, that we had talked about putting a uh, um, cul-de-sac or uh, barricades or whatever at the end of the street. Once people get to the end of the street, they're only going to do it once if they know that they can't exit onto highway number eight. 
So there has to be a resolution, whether it's signage or some other type of effort to resolve the problem of people that are not residents on that street. And there's a lot of speed because they get to the point and they go up the hill faster. Um, and that was the reason for having the 30 kilometer sign put there just to have them pay attention to the narrowness of that street. So I feel that there should be some resolution and not just leave this hanging and come back at it again. Any other councillor have a question or comment on this? Councillor Fisk? Um, I, I feel very strongly that uh, to hand another sign won't help the matter whatsoever. I think people are gonna still use that road and uh, there's a lot of people I've talked to that question me about the road and they're totally upset because it is sign that's there now. Putting a sign up so directly into the lights won't help one bit. That's my opinion. Councilor Curley? Mr. Regent, has the ability to do our own sign should CIR refuse this? Do they all? Uh, within the bounds of Liverpool, yes. So why wouldn't we just do that? I mean, that seems like a an easier solution rather than go through the CIR mm -hmm. route. Is that, to, is that the motion of council to put that forward? But it hasn't been the motion of council today. The motion of council has been to <coughs> Kilometer sign, but there's a no exit to Highway 8 sign, and then there's a third sign there, I believe. So the staff have done what the motions of council have been. Okay, but we still haven't solved the problem, so. Uh, keep in mind that there is one large sign there now, and adding a sign to that may be easier than trying to erect another sign and maintain visibility of both signs. That's not the motion before us. I understand that, but you could amend the motion. If there are many options available down the road, this one does not pass. However, that's the one in front of you today. Okay. Any other comment today on this issue? Councilor McLeod? So an amendment can be made to this motion? No? No. It has to come back at another time. Is that what you're saying? I don't think this can ever come back again. Okay, so we only have one kick of the can under reconsideration. Okay, then maybe I misunderstood. You mentioned the word amendment, so how can that fit into this? Amendment to. I thought, did you mention about an amendment? That was me. That I was you? Okay. That we okay. So, any other comments on this item before us? Are you ready for the question? Question. All those in favor of the motion? Those opposed? We have six to one. It is passed. <coughs> Moving on to 9.2 on secured loads. Councilor Fancy, you would ask that this one go on. Okay. Uh, why I want to bring this up today in particular is that uh, you know, we, we've had we've had meetings. We're going to have meetings on uh, on our, our land here and how we uh, what we do with the region with with waste and uh, uh, all the problems we have with uh, littering and everything else. Which littering isn't ours. Ours is uh, is, uh, is uh, illegal dumping. Uh, as we know how the county is, we know what. Frustrating for everyone with everything that goes on, but we had an I had an incident on Saturday where someone called me up and uh, they were falling behind a half ton truck out to the landfill from Liverpool. Bag fell off the truck, hit on the road, smashed. They just uh, they almost hit it and uh, they stopped, took the bag off the road, but glass was laying all over the road everywhere. So then they had to call somebody else to come pick up the glass and move that up. They said. What do I do? What do we do? Do we call the RCMP? What do we do? I said, I don't really know. I, I said, the RCMP would be the most logical thing to do. So I called up the landfill and I called, I said, what's going on there? Because there's a truck going up, just bag the guy. 
Arab come back. Uh, and uh, they, they said, that when we get out there, of course, we have a sign up there that says they must be tarped. And we, we say that, uh, you know, you, you must tarp that. Uh, the message isn't getting through for uh, whatever it may be. So uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, we're, we're finding more and more in the ditch that things are coming off. And uh, first off, our signage up there saying tarp is the top right. Lens and things on your car, it's going to be hard to put a tarp over a lens. You can take rope and tie it all down. So, so it, uh, the, the, it should be saying unsecure, be secure, not tarp. Uh, because secure means different things in different ways. Tarp isn't the, isn't the whole answer to, to what, it, what it should be. So uh, I, I look at that and I say, uh, first off, the sign it doesn't work the way, the way it's set up. Uh, the, how do we. Uh, uh, and how we're enforcing it, and we're, and we're trying our best, you know, trying to say, need to secure your load, but people don't seem to be abiding by it. Uh, I think that we need to be looking at trying to break some warnings. It's, it's a, something that has more more power, or more punch, and I know it's, it's hard because it's, they say they're coming from the highway, and we have nothing to do with the highway. All we have to do is with, uh, with, uh, with, with landing there when it lands on our property. So uh, it's a it's a concern uh, that alone, not not just trying to look at the, the litter and everything as a look as a, as a whole, but just the unsecured load aspect of it. People are doing this every Saturday in particular. Or, or I see them go there all the time, going through nothing on them because people are just doing a one-time thing, going up to get rid of the garbage. They they need to they need to have this uh, one area. This could have been an accident. Could have been a bad scene. What if she would drove around it? What if somebody else would have drove over it? You know, all this glass and things. So I think it's getting to a point where that's why I wanted to bring it here today in particular. Not just this unsecured, but the safety aspect of uh, we need to. Uh, uh, I know we have meetings coming up with other, with our uh, our groups again about the, how we're going to handle everything with uh, litter and, and garbage and everything. And we will go through all those things, but this one here in particular is this concern that happened on Saturday. Did they call the RCMP? Did we call uh, the landfill? You know, how do how do we approach these things? We can get these things down so everybody knows. Councilor Fancy, as, as you've mentioned, there is an effort of councilors and staff uh, and those outside uh, providers such as the RCMP and TIR and those others that have responsibilities for litter and such. And I know that all involved, including yourself, will try to arrive at solutions to remedy prevention for the item that you actually stated today. Uh, I would encourage you to bring up those items at that committee and work towards solutions. And, and I would uh, defer to the CAO. Uh, he may have some comments on this as we move forward. Uh, just that we've talked about the issue many times, and if uh, Councillor Fancy has a particular recommendation or something for Council to consider, then forward for discussion either at the council floor or at the ad hoc committee that's been formed to talk about litter. Um, but unless there's some direction to staff, then there's not a lot we can do. And really, anything that, any safety issues on the highway are, are RCMP issues. Uh, absolutely. Councilor Lafayette? This isn't a question, but it's just a comment respecting the topic. Um, there have been some advertisements placed by the municipality in the papers. Uh, I think I saw it in South Shore Breaker about unsecured loads and that sort of thing. So getting the message out to the public in whatever form we can is important because uh, that also is a good way to get the message out. And I thank uh, uh, Councillor Fancy for bringing the topic up today. I know it, there's a discussion about it and there's no motion, but now that we are being recorded and our audio and that sort of thing has improved a bit, getting those messages, messages out in any fashion is a good thing to do. Thank you, Council McLeod. Any other councillors? So, Council Fancy, do you have any parting comments on this one? No, I, I could I could be saying looking for put a recommendation in for next council meeting, but I think I'll defer that to our uh, meetings with our group with the council, and then we can be able to put all motions together. Uh, but as as uh, as uh, the Council McLeod said, I wanted to. 
get it over here as much as anything else is over the public. Either, and maybe people get more aware of it, and maybe be thinking about Saturday cleanup. If they, they'd be able to make sure that they make it safe for everybody else on the highway. Thank you, Councilor Pansy. That sounds like a reasonable approach. And, uh, we'll, we'll meet with success. Moving on to 10.0 Engineering and Public Works, we have nothing there today. Under 11.0 Finance, we have 11.1 .1, Adoption of Audit of 2019-2020 Financial Statements, and uh, a copy will be available to the public upon adoption and signing. Uh, I would ask uh, uh. Jennifer Keating Hughley, our Director of Finance. Our Director of Finance, Jennifer Keating Hoogley, is now in the presentation chair. And Jennifer, we have uh, moved and seconded, seconded the uh, adoption of the audit of financial statements. And now we're, we're to a point where if you have any comments you'd like to provide us at this point. I was um, pleased with the information provided by Greg Thornton in the overview. Um, my staff did a wonderful job this year of providing all the all the recommended um, verifications 
and that everybody was really quick to answer their questions and provide all the information and the samples and, and uh, documentation that they needed to complete their audit this year. So I think it went rather smoothly considering we were remote and everything had to be scanned and, and sent to them um, via secure sites. So it worked well, it was different, but it, was, it went smooth. Any questions of Jennifer by Councilor? Councilor Mathai? I just had the question before you came in the room, Jennifer. Uh, how often are the auditors uh, appointed for, is it every two years? This one years? was actually a three-year appointment. So this was their second year, and they will be providing the audited services next year as well. Okay. Any other questions of Councilors? Councilor Fancy? I did notice something they said yesterday. They said they could do an audit on the whole thing, but a different section could do uh, not audit as the three say. We do like grab samples of, of, of things rather than. So the their audit, audit consists of the consolidated statements, so a combination of all of our departments and all of our, our resources. Uh, the non consolidated statements they do consider non audited. Those are reviewed though because those provide all of the backup information that's required to fully verify the consolidation. And they get answered anyway on the uh, when it goes into the main page. So exactly. Know, for the real thing. Yeah. Any other questions? Are you ready for the question? Question. question. All those in favor of the motion? It is unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. That brings us to 11.2, staff recommendation three. Council McLeod had asked for this to be on the agenda. Yes, McLeod. yes, at the last meeting we had a discussion about the cost of living recommendation or the, the uh, actually the cost of living adjustment. And from reading the audio video of that meeting, uh, there was a direction by yourself, uh, Mayor Dagley, for our uh, director of finance to come back with a recommendation and I don't see that on our agenda today, so I was just wondering if that was deferred or not. So to, to respond to that, um, my memory of the last council meeting was that it was stated that the director of finance could bring back a recommendation if it was so decided. Uh, it was not decided to bring it back for a number of reasons. And of course, the major reason being that the policy procedure that we have for staff increases according to the Nova Scotia Consumer Price Index increase was minus 0.5 this year. And we do not recover uh, monies from salaried individuals in the region of Queens under that situation. Uh, we do, however, if there is an increase in the Nova Scotia CPI, policy procedure automatically recommends to council the amount of that increase. There was no increase, so therefore there is no staff recommendation for an increase. Yeah, but okay. they, they are council uh, available, to, uh, are they able to make a recommendation without the finance department's suggestion? Uh, council is able to do so, but it would not be following the policy and procedure that's in place for that to occur on a regular basis if there's an increase in the consumer price index. Uh, one would need to keep into consideration that if the economy has slowed this year, one would expect that there's a likelihood that next year it will increase. And any increase that would be provided this year in a decrease would be offset again next year with an increase. Uh, one can't predict the future, but those policies and procedures are there to be consistent. And, and of course, as you asked, Yes, council can intercede. Uh, is it appropriate? Well, that's that's up to council to decide. So policies and procedures. Procedures is a suggestion, but policies we have to stay in, within the policy. So I'm going to defer to our CAO okay. to clarify that. Just, right. just to get clarification. They they are one and the same. You're, it's just different terminology. Okay. So a motion of council is a policy of council. Um, a procedure of council is a policy of council. A formal policy in the policy book of council is a policy of council. So we use different terminologies for different things, but essentially they're all policies of council. So there was never a recommendation that was uh, um, not, there was 
no recommendation at all on the cost of living plan. It was just a discussion that we had. We had a discussion last meeting because staff were unable to put forward a recommendation for a motion due to the decrease in Nova Scotia consumer price index. Okay. And that was stated in that presentation last council meeting. Yes, I realize that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Councilor Fancy? Yeah, I, I think uh, our CAO did explain it somewhat in, in that because uh, you don't want to feel like you're doing your staff wrong. And that, that's the whole thing, you don't want to do a staff wrong. But uh, he, uh, he's, he, if I'm correct, he was saying, I think a few years back, like he had a, a 2.8 instead of a 2.0. So sometimes you go more, and so you, you, you gain when you, you gain when you gain, you lose when you lose, so to speak. You go if you keep on the same path of the, of the CPI and, and saying that it's going to a level out, so the staff doesn't take a beating too. But. Any other counselor have a comment on this issue? Welcome back to Council McLeod. Okay. Um, so there. So am I able to make a re uh, make a recommendation now? Uh, and the forty-eight hour notice is not applicable to this. Since no, Council McLeod, a forty-eight hour notice on a substantive motion is still required, and you would not be able to make a motion on a monetary issue today. However, the last meeting, it was stated that we possibly could have a recommendation. So wouldn't that be a motion? No, it would have to be in the agenda packet that was sent out on Thursday. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other comments on this item today? Hearing none, thank you all for your conversation today on this item. We will move on now to 12.0, Recreation and Health and Community. We have nothing under that today. Under 13.0 planning, we have 13.1, amend land use bylaw to rezone the bid 70154695-9698 Caledonia. And I should note that Councillor Hughes was not present last night, so he's unable to participate in the discussion of this issue today. Uh, our Director of Planning, Mr. Cloud, is uh, now at the desk. We have a, uh, a recommendation, I do believe, yeah. under 13.1 under this issue. Who would like to move that? Uh, Deputy Mayor Kelly? I recommend that the Council of the Region of Queen's Municipality give second reading to bylaw respecting amendments to the land use bylaw, which seems the rezoning of PID number 7015469 from industrial I1. Oh, sorry, institutional. I one to highway commercial C two. Second to that motion, Councillor Frill. Mike, would you like to give us an update on this item? Yes, Mr. Mayor, as a, a, a brief background, um, as you're all aware, the region is in the process of trying to sell the property at 9692 Highway in Caledonia. Uh, most will recognize this as the uh, former school bus garage for North Queens. Currently, the region has a pending offer on the property um, from an individual who wishes to operate a uh, apple cider um, production business at that location. Um, so this is a condition of sale that the property be appropriately zoned to allow for this use. So right now, as all school properties are zoned, um, uh, there's an institutional I-1 uh, land use zoning designation on the property as well. The property carries with it a, uh, a future land use of, of institutional. So the use being uh, proposed by the uh, prospective purchaser um, would fall under the category of a microbrewery under the definition section in the, in the land use bylaw. And this is a use that would be uh, considered under the, the Highway Commercial C2 zone. So in order to enable um, this operation to, uh, to run on the, uh, this, this property, um, uh, rezoning of the property to the Highway Commercial um, C2 zone would be required. Um, 
policy 12.5.2 of the municipal planning strategy outlines the, the things that council um, takes into consideration when uh, looking at amendments to the land use bylaw, and that's included in the, the staff report. So the property itself, um, it's a, it's a 5.6 acre parcel of land, which is a, a fairly considerable um, size parcel for, I guess, the downtown Caledonia core area. There is a 3,900 square foot commercial building located on the property, uh, constructed around the mid eighties. Um, up until a couple of years ago, the property was uh, uh, maintained by the, uh, the school board for operation of the bus garage, but when that uh, 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 property became redundant for use as a school bus garage, the property was turned back to the municipality. Um, so since that time, um, the property has been vacant and we've had it listed through real estate uh, for sale. So. Um, so in order to consider um, the proposed use on that property and rezoning to the highway commercial C2 will be required. Thank you, Mike. Uh, are there any questions of Mike of Council or any comments? Council Hansen? Yeah, I just, I should just uh, also say too is that when we look at the, we look at the recommendation, we know what we're going through changing to the zoning and we hear what he wants to do with it it's, it's not always that they are held to doing what they're, except for the zoning change, uh, they can, because I keep hearing, well, they're gonna do this, it's great for Calvin, and it's great if he goes that way, but it doesn't mean he has to use that. He, he's not uh, he's not taken into that to say that's what he gets to do. The, that's that's uh, correct. doing is the zoning change. Yeah, that, that, that's correct, Councilor. Yeah, there's only just language that goes along with it. Yeah. This, the, I guess the microbrewery is one of the permitted uses within the right. C2. Right. Um, I guess in looking at the sale of the property and, and whether it was this purchaser or somebody else, the, 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 the current zoning as, as institutional is, right. is quite limited and, and right. the uh, future use of that property is, is certainly limited and potential right. purchasers yeah. as well. So um, at some point in time, um, whether it was this uh, purchaser or somebody else, we, we would likely have been required to rezone that anyway to allow for, for different types of uses. So, but you're correct. Yeah. And uh, also just want to make a comment here, I'd like to commend the, the, the region for doing something with the sound system because Mike isn't a, isn't a really a, uh, a loud speaker, but I can hear him very plainly. So it's, it's really, it's a, a lot, lot better. Any other councilor, councilor Fisk? I just want to say that uh, this is uh, obviously the hearing last night and I, I really appreciate uh, the involvement of the uh, Caledonia people and uh, around the area and uh, I, I think it's one of the greatest moves that happened in, in Caledonia at this time. I see this is a, a great uh, future and hopefully it'll help out that area. Thank you, councilor Fisk. Any other council? Councilor Fry? The, uh, I guess the, the purchaser of the property certainly should be commended for bringing that to a small area such as Caledonia. Caledonia is a hub of the North Queens area and uh, with the, they're trying to have a program or the project, the gateway, um, that is the gateway project. That certainly, this type of business certainly adds to that. And uh, it's also potential employment in the area so, I mean, this is just the beginning of what can happen to, with that facility, uh, with that building, and with the, uh, the uh, vision that the new owners have for that. Mm -hmm. Any other counselor? Are you ready for the question? Question. All those in favor of the motion? It is unanimous of those that are permitted to vote. Thank you. That brings us to 14.0 reports. We have no reports today. And that brings us to 15.0 in camera. And that is the portion of council meeting which is uh, only available to councilors. Uh, a motion to move in camera would be appropriate. Moved by Deputy Mayor Kelly. Seconded by Councilor News. Any discussion? Are you ready for the question? Question. All those in favor of the motion? and we'll recess for 15 minutes. We'll
Thank you. 